السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين We ask Allah سبحانه وتعالى that he grants us توفيق and success and makes us of the people of Aqeedah and Manhaj and that he keeps us steadfast on it until we meet him This is another session where we are looking at Aqeed Tahawiyya of Abu Jafar Al-Tahawi Al-Hanafi Rahimahullah and last week we began by looking at what he had to say when it comes to prophethood of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he says Rahimahullah in about three or four bullet points in talking about what we must believe when it comes to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam so he said وَأَنَّ مُحَمَّدٍ عَبْدُهُ الْمُسْتَفَى وَنَبِيُّهُ الْمُجْتَبَى وَالرَّسُولُ الْمُتَدَى Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is his chosen servant he is the one that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has selected to be his prophet and that he is the messenger that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with. And he is the seal of all prophets. And he is the imam of all of those who had taqwa. And he is the leader of all the prophets and the messengers. And he is the habib to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is where we stopped. Now, inshallah, today there's two or three more bullet points left in talking about uh, our belief in Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he says now, point number 31. وَكُلُّ دَعْوَ النَّبُوَّةَ بَعْدَهُ فَغَيُّنْ وَهَوَى Anyone who calls to prophethood uh, after he has been sent sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then all of it is misguidance and all of it is desires and deviation. <coughs> point number 32. وَهُوَ الْمَبْعُوثِ إِلَىٰ عَامَةِ الْجِنْ وَكَافْتُ وَرَىٰ He has been sent to all of jinn and all of man. He has no particular nation. He is sent to everyone. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Bil Haqqi wal Huda, he has been sent with the truth and guidance. Wa bin Nuri wa Diya and with light and an illumination. This is what the author has to say about uh, the sending and of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and our belief in him as a Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And I'm pretty sure, like we have said before, uh, that Imam al Tahawi rahimahullah he sometimes repeats points. So the point of us believing in Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam being the messenger, uh, I am pretty sure somewhere later on in the book he's going to talk about it again, and we'll be having this conversation inshallah again at some point. But this is what he has to say when it comes to our belief in Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam as a prophet. For now, in this section, uh, in last week's. Dars, <coughs> we talked about a number of things and we said that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has names and those are five names which are found in Sahih Bukhari and most of what you see here are all attributes of him, all characteristics of him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that's a very important point because sometimes people, and this is how exaggeration of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam begins, they create names and perhaps even attributes of him which have not been narrated, which have not been narrated. And then you will find, with that extremism, leading towards shirk. So it's important for us to understand that his name is Muhammad, his name is Ahmed, his name is Mahi, his name is Hashir, and his name is Aqib. These are the five names that he gave to himself, uh, and this is a narration that you find in Sayyid Bukhari. Anything else that you find, as what the author is saying, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls him a servant. Subhanallah asra bi abdihi laylan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even says in Surah Al Jinn, Falamma qama abdullah. So these are now attributes that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes him as being Al Mustafa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al Hajj, Allahu yastafi min al malaika rusulim wa min al nas. In Allah yastafa min al malaika. <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses from his angels and his and men from mankind uh, messengers and Allah is Samir Basir and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hears and, all th- and sees all things therefore the description of him being Al-Mustafa has now been attributed to him because of the generality of this ayah the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the Mushtaba and he is the Murtada. But again, like I said, these are all attributes. How do we know it's an attribute? Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says in Surah Al-Jinn also, 
illa man yatada min rasul Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala min ghayb wa la yathru ala ghaybihi ahada Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the unseen and none can be given a share of the unseen at all and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says illa man yatada min rasul Except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen and is pleased with from prophethood. فَإِنَّهُ يَسْلُكُ مِنْ بَيْنِ يَدَيْهِ وَمِنْ خَلْفِهِ رَصَدَ And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will preserve him from in front of him and from behind him. So the point here that we're making here is that these are attributes given to him. He's the seal of the prophets. He's the imam of atqiyah. He's the sayyid al mursaleen And he is a habib for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're going to talk about that in a moment. But it's important for us to understand at this point, names one thing, attributes is another. What we also studied last week is looking at the importance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala giving us a messenger. And we said that there are three things connected to this. Number one, iman. Belief that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us and commanded us to believe in him and the prophets and the books, etc. So it is part of that. It is part of your iman. Also, it is part of what we said last week, dala'il al-nabuwa. Dala'il al-nabuwa. Prophethood. How do you know that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is actually a prophet? There are signs that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has given us and these are some of the things that we are studying here that we can know and recognize him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that he has come with prophethood and that he, what he says is the truth. A third reason as to why this study is important because it increases a person in submission and humility in front of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Because when a person knows that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has come with a message, he knows that he couldn't have done that himself, meaning yourself. You believe in Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, you want to enter into his Jannah, you want to please him, but how? That can only, become, that can only come about with you following the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the fact that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has sent you a Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam increases a person, its submission to Allah, Humility to Allah and following of the Messenger of Allah. This is just a summary of what we did last week. We stopped at Wa Habibu Rabbil Alameen, and He is the Habib of the Lord of all that exists. Now, at this point, we have to understand that the people of Kalam, people of philosophy, they reject that Allah loves, and some of them even reject that Allah can be loved. This might sound ajeeb and strange, but what they say is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, according to their conjuncture, they say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot love. This is because they see love as being a sign of imperfection and weakness, having emotions. They, they, they will then say, this is likening Allah to the creation. They will then say, if you say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves, does that mean he has feelings? Does that mean he has uh, wants and things like that? If you say that Allah loves, it means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is affected by the creation. If you say that Allah loves, then how is he supposed to establish the haqq when he's got emotion? And it's not a nice, to, nice thing to say these things, but this is all part of philosophy. This is all part of philosophy. So the conclusion for them is that they say no emotions for Allah. Allah does not love. Hence what the author is saying here, Wahhabib Rabbil Alameen, he is affirming that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves in a manner that befits his majesty. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes himself as being Wahuwa Ghafoor al Wadud. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives and he is Al Wadud. And Wadud basically means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Loves. And specifically about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loving those who are closer to him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَاتَّخَذَ إِبْرَاهِيمُ Khalila. وَاتَّخَذَ اللَّهُ إِبْرَاهِيمُ Khalila. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took Ibrahim as a Khalil. Now here's the point that we want to make. The ulama have said, Hub is lower than Khulla. So now the author is saying here that he is the Habib Rabbil Alameen. This is actually, as some of the ulama who explain that Akhir Tahawi have said, this is actually a deficiency in the description of him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَاتَّخَذُ اللَّهُ إِبْرَهِيمَ خَلِيلًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took Ibrahim as a khalil. Khulla is the highest form of love. So when you are saying that Muhammad sallallahu is a habib, that means he is lower when it comes to Ibrahim in the way that Allah loves him. Which cannot be correct. Especially with the fact that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu said, إِنَّ صَاحِبُكُمْ خَلِيلٌ الرَّحْمَانِ This is a hadith in Sahih Muslim. He said, إِنَّ صَاحِبُكُمْ Meaning, he's referring to himself, but he's saying this out of humility. He says, your companion, referring to himself, وسلم, is a Khalil Rahman. Now here, I mean, this is just a side point. It's very important for us to know. Now, well, it's not really a side point. We're talking about the Messenger of Allah وسلم. It's important for us to know that the ulama have mentioned that there's never ever been a favor that has been given to any one of the Anbiya and the Rusul before us except that Muhammad وسلم, has been given something which is equivalent or even better. There's never been a person who has been given something as a miracle except that Muhammad وسلم, was given something which is equivalent or which is better. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants khulla to Ibrahim, it is not likely that Muhammad وسلم, would be outdone by that. And you can look at examples from other Anbiya and Rusul and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave miracles and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala supported them. And you will find every single one of these uh, given to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also. Who was he sent to? Before we get to that, he says, Anyone who claims that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, was not the final Prophet and that other people can have prophethood given to them, then the author is saying here, all of that is deviation. And how are, now this is important, I think we talked about this before. There are deviant sects who say that their sheikh or their imam or their religious leader has a share in revelation. Now you might find this being strange but this is found in this city. This is found in the Muslim Ummah where they basically say that our Shaykh receives revelation from Allah and he may know the unseen and he may know about your affairs, etc, etc. The author is saying here, anyone who claims to have any kind of share of Nubu after him, then that person is far astray and he is following his desires and he has deviated from the correct path. Now, what the author is saying here is that that person has deviated. This deviation is not a normal deviation. Deviation is of two types, or three types. Deviation, where a person deviates when he becomes sinful. So if a person engages in major sin, if a person engages in things which are not permissible, we will say that that person has deviated. This is a form of deviation. The second form of deviation is where a person has deviated from the correct aqidah and manhaj, but the person is still within Ahl sunnah And this deviation is known as bid'ah. But then there's another type of deviation which is the worst form of deviation, which is the deviation of kufr and shirk and maybe even nifaq. And this deviation is where a person completely goes against what has been uh, come to us from the heart. So when he is saying here that such a person has deviated, which one is he talking about? One, two or three? If a person was to say, I believe that there's a prophet, or there is revelation that can come to someone after. Is that a sin? Is that bid'ah or is that kufr? That's kufr. Clear cut kufr. So the call of the Qadiyaniya and the call of the Ismailiya and the call of just generally the Shia, all of these things are kufr which takes a person outside the fold of Islam. The author, before we move on to that point, there was another thing that I wanted to mention when he says, what Imam al he's the Imam of the people who have taqwa. What is taqwa? Excellent. Fitla ta'at, mushtiban al ma'asi. Where a person does good deeds and he stays away from something which is not permissible for a person to do. 
The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the Imam of those people who have taqwa Meaning he always did the right thing and he always stayed away from those things which are not Beloved to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala So in order for you to attain taqwa, he is your Imam So next question, what is the Imam? And this is something again, so that some of the ulama have actually uh, talked about In blaming people some of the ulama have said to call a person an imam or an allama or even a sheikh and things like this has become very easy for people to do today. And one of the reasons I would say why is because they don't know what an imam or what a sheikh is, perhaps. So they just see someone as being religious and he's got some knowledge, he might have some following or something like that, and start calling him names and labels. What is an imam? The person who leads the salat? The person who is in charge of the masjid? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, Inna Ibrahim kana ummatan qanitan lillah hanifan wa lam yakum min mushrikeen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ibrahim was an ummah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls him a leader. And with this we learn, that an Imam is a person who is followed in all areas. An Imam is a person who is followed in all areas. An Allama is a person who is followed in all areas. So for example, from the recent ulama, we have Sheikh Muhammad Nisar al Thameen, Sheikh Aziz bin Baz, Sheikh Muhammad Al Albani. May Allah have mercy on all of them. Okay, any one of those scholars, were you to follow them in Aqidah, would you be in safe hands? Yes, I would imagine so. If you were to follow them in their fiqh opinions, would you be in safe hands or would you be following something which might not be right? No, these people, they know what they're talking about when it comes to fiqh. What about when it comes to actions? As in, they're telling you to do something or you see them doing something or you have heard from them that you should do something. Again, you'd be in safe hands. What about when it comes to any other aspects of it? I think you get the idea here now. So when you've got something that's come to you from someone like what they mean, someone like Bimba, someone like Urbani, that pedigree and that caliber, you can then say, okay, you know what? I've never heard anything from this sheikh that contradicts what is from the Quran. So this is not to say that people don't make mistakes. Of course, mistakes are going to happen. But what we're saying here is, is that this person is so firmly grounded in all areas and aspects of Islam, he then becomes an imam. مِنْ كُلِّ وَجْهِ This is what the ulama said. An imam is somebody who is followed from all aspects. So in aqidah he's an imam, in fiqh he's an imam, in hadith he's an imam, in akhlaq he's an imam, in ibadah he's an imam, and those kind of things. Now, the author then goes on to say, وَإِمَامُ الْأَسْكِيَا وَسَيْدُ الْمُرْسِيمُ وَحَبِيبِ الرَّبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ We've done all of that. And we've just done that as well. Anyone who claims then, now we can understand the severity of the situation. If a person was then to claim that they have a share in this kind of prophethood and this risala, then this is completely misguidance. Now the reason why this is misguidance, as we all know, that we say, Ashhadu anna Muhammad abduhu wa rasul, that we bear witness that our Nabi is Muhammad So if anybody comes afterwards and says, no, I'm your Nabi, then you know that that person is lying and it goes against your... Um, it goes against your iman and the things that you believe in. But Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah, he actually explains to us that the Anbiya and the Rusul came, there's not never been a prophet or a messenger, except that they came with three principles. Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah, said that the sending of every single prophet and messenger, they came with three things. When we can understand these three things, then we can understand that anybody who claims to be a prophet after him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then he is a liar. He is a dajjal, as he said himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Number one, there's never been a prophet or a messenger, except that the first principle that they came with was tawheed. Teaching people who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, teaching people about his names and his attributes, and teaching them that they should worship him alone, subhanahu. Now let's put this to the test. You've got people who've come after Muhammad and they have claimed to be prophets. 
Has any single one of them said that you should worship Allah alone? I mean, alhamdulillah, it's not much of a fitna here. But you will find even in the West, people like uh, Louis Farrakhan, uh, Nation of Islam. The Nation of Islam is full of examples of shirk that they have. Um, I'm trying to think of Qadianis. They believe that Ahmed uh, Ghulam Mirza is a prophet that came after the Prophet Well known that these people are Kuburiyun. They say you should go to the grave and they should make shirk in this manner. The Shia, they believe that prophethood should have been given to Ali Radilan and it was given to Muhammad وسلم, by mistake. But out of well, this is what they believe. Out of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed, there will be imams that come afterwards who will carry on from Ahlul Bayt, from the lineage of Ali radiallahu who will carry on the, message, the messengership and the prophethood that should have been given to Ali. All of this is an example of those people who say that there is a messenger and a prophet after Muhammad wasallam. This is not to be founded, except that they are calling towards shirk. That's the first thing. Second thing, Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah said, there's never been a prophet or a messenger except that they came with taqwa. And precisely what Abdullah said as a definition here, this is what Ibn Qayyim is saying here. There's never been a prophet or a messenger that have come except that they have shown the path to his ummah, to his ummah, that which will bring about the love of Allah. In acts of worship, in how to be humble towards him, in how to be thankful towards him, in how to worship him, into how to be patient. And there's never been a prophet, this is still the second principle, and there's never been a prophet or a messenger except that they have warned their ummah and their nation on things not to do in acts of worship, in acts of uh, lacking of patience, etc. This way, Ibn Qayyim then goes on, they have come to show you how to humble yourself and have awe of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Never been a prophet or messenger except that they came to tell their ummah and teach their ummah how to increase in your awe and love for him. And we don't need to repeat ourselves, but if you apply this principle again to those people, you won't find it. Third principle as to why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we said why last time, the three things we talked about, iman, and dalai, and nubuwa, and humility. Here, what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send them with? We've got tawheed, and we've got taqwa. And the third thing is to teach them about a reckoning that is bound to take place. There's never been a prophet or a messenger except that they came to tell their ummah that the land that you are living in right now is not the land that you are supposed to be staying in. There's a land which is better. A land full of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala generosity. A land where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will only admit for those people who he is pleased with. Therefore there's never been a prophet or a messenger except that he told his ummah that you are going to die, you will be resurrected, and you will stand in front of Allah and you will be reckoned. These are the three things that Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah, is saying that what every single messenger came with, without fail. So when we are talking about the messenger of Allah وسلم, and how he is an imam and he, how he is a khatim and how he is a sayyid and how he is a abd and how he is a nabi and how he is a rasul and anybody who says anything otherwise is upon misguidance and deviation, this is because these three principles, these three principles are found in him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَهُوَ الْمَبْعُوثِ إِلَىٰ آمَةِ الْجِنِّ وَكَافَةِ الْوَرَاءِ He is sent to all of jinn and all of mankind. This is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the many ayat in the Qur'an where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands him to say, قُلْ يَا النَّاسِ إِنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِلَيْكُمْ جَمِيعًا Say mankind, I am a messenger to you all. Therefore the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wasn't sent to a group of people or a particular culture or to the Arabs alone or to the non-Arabs alone. 
the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sent to all of man and all of jinn. So after the coming of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there is none that they have to accept that they have to follow him. Hence he says in the hadith which is found in the Sahih, where he says sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, by the one who's handed my soul, nobody after they have heard me coming from the Yahud and the Nasara, except that if they have they have to believe in me. And if they don't, Illa Kan except that they will be from the inhabitants of the fire. Now this is very important because with him coming, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, not only does it mean that he is sent to everyone, but it also means that any messenger or any book that came before, all of that has been abrogated with the coming of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because he has been sent to everyone. Now this is important as well because you I've met people and you've probably seen this yourselves. I've actually met a Christian once and that person was saying, I know that Muhammad is a prophet. I know that Muhammad is a prophet. But he is a prophet for your location and Jesus was a prophet for our location. And I believe that Jesus is superior to Muhammad because he believed obviously that Jesus is the son of God, except all that kind of stuff. But he says in his ration, in how he can reconcile and bring it all together, he says basically that Muhammad is a prophet. And he says it in our book. And he didn't deny any of these things. But the only way that he could get out of the da'wah that we were giving to him was to, for him to then basically say, he is a prophet for you guys, and that's good, and you guys should follow him. But we believe in Jesus as the saviour, etc. But that's wrong. And that's wrong and incorrect on more than one front, which we probably don't have the time to talk about right now. But here, what the author is basically saying is that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is not sent to Banu Israel, he's not sent to uh, the Arabs or uh, the Asians or whatever it might be, he is sent to every single one from man and jinn. <coughs> here is a question. Is it possible now, based on what this person has said, is it possible for messengers and prophets to have ranking or are they all the same? Meaning, are some better than others, or are they all the same? Some are better than others. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لا نفرق بين أهل من We do not make any kind of differentiation between any of them. The Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa sallam said, Whoever says that I am better than Yunus bin Mutta, then that person is a liar. Why does he use Yunus bin Mutta as an example? Because Yunus bin Mutta alayhi salam, was told to give da'wah to his people. What did he do? He was giving da'wah, he was giving da'wah, and then he got fed up with him, he got angry with him, and he walked away. So if you guys don't want to listen to me, forget it, I'm going. Without permission from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he embarked on a ship. I'm sure you've had the story before. The ship started to capsize, it started going through rough waters, etc. So the captain of the ship is saying, we need to throw all our stuff off board. So that we can have some kind of stability. That wasn't enough. So now what that basically means is humans need to jump into the sea. Which basically means it's very likely that you're going to die. So they drew lots and Eunice, three times, one after the other, was picked. So he jumps over and he knows that this is from the Qadr of Allah. And a whale swallows him up. What was the purpose of this? Then he recognizes that this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he's now, as the ulama and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes, in darkness upon darkness upon darkness, darkness of the night, the darkness inside of the fish, and darkness of the sea. So imagine that, everything's split back. And imagine you're inside this whale. It's not very nice. It's not going to be a nice environment. Obviously you're going to be worried. What does he do? He just repeats. In making dua and istighfar to Allah, La ilaha illa anta subhanak, inni kuntu min al dhalimin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, Funajaynahu min al gham, mukadali ka nunjil mu'minin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then removed him of his sadness and his hardship. What's the hardship? He's inside the belly of a whale. No matter what you go through in your life, I don't think there's anything that can be compared to that. You don't know where you are, you don't know what's happened to you, you don't even know how you got there. Darkness upon darkness, the smell, the, the uncertainty. He's making sujood inside of a whale. Has anyone done that before? 
And then we're going to do that again. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. What does he do though? La ilaha illa anta subhanak inni kuntu min al-zalimi. And Ibn Rajab Rahim has a beautiful speech on this. He basically says, look now yeah, at the time of desperation. What does he do? He didn't say, well, I'm sorry. I should not have done this. La, 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 la. What does he do? La ilaha illa ant. Everything goes back to what? Aqeel. Tawheed. The quickest way for salvation was for him to say, La ilaha illa ant. The quickest way for him to recognize his mistake and to seek the reward of Allah and to seek the relief of Allah was for him to say, La ilaha illa ant. Subhanak, how perfect are you? What does that mean? What does he mean by that, Subhanak? You are the one that's perfect. I'm full of mistakes. There is no deity worthy of worship except you. You are the one that can help me in this situation. Hence, I am worshipping you. You are the one that is perfect, Subhanak. Now here's the imperfection. Now here's the tawbah and here's the istighfar. Inni kuntum in I have done something wrong. Just repeating that, repeating that, repeating. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings him to Allah relief. Akbar, Allah commands. Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. Before we digress and go on to stories of the prophets, I think we should go back to Aqeel Tahawi. So now here, Yunus alayhi salam has made a mistake. The Messenger of Allah وسلم, said, anyone who says that I am uh, better than Yunus alayhi salam, then he is a liar. You got a question? Do you have your hand up? No, I've answered it, alhamdulillah. Right. So with this now, the ulama have mentioned, how do we then re- reconcile this where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Tilka rusul these are the messengers and some of them are better than others how then we can we reconcile this with that and then what's the reconciliation the reconciliation with Ahlul Sunnah is, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has got prophets and messengers which are better than one another and this is uh, an indication we get from at tahawi here was Sayyidul Mursaleen. He is the leader of the messengers, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And he said, "And a Sayyid wal Adam, wala fakhr. I am the leader of the children of Adam, and I'm saying this without being arrogant and boasting. I'm not saying it for that reason. I am saying it to inform you that I am going to be the leader of all of mankind, yom al even before that, even now, that's the title that he's got, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He is the best of all mankind. But why did he say it? He said, Walafakh. I'm not saying this out of uh, arrogance. I'm saying this so that you guys know. 
And here is another indication of that. He has been sent to all of jinn and all of mankind. This is now never happened before. There's never been a prophet or messenger except that he had a specific mission with a specific group of people. Another indication that the messenger of Allah is the best of all of them. And there are many evidences, the fact that he led them all on the night of uh, Isra, etc. But one of them, as the ulama have mentioned, is that he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, has been sent to all of mankind. And that's not happened before. With this, we have to say something which is really important, an issue in Aqeedah, which is now. One of the ways that the people of the book before us deviated and rejected Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa There's a number of reasons as to why they rejected him. But one of the main reasons why they rejected him, just like you see this guy that I was telling you about a moment ago, this is the same thing happening until now. But in the presence of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa they rejected him because they saw themselves as being better. They saw themselves as having something better. They said Musa is better than Muhammad. Even though they recognized him as being a messenger. Like this guy here, he says, I know he's a messenger, I know he's a prophet, but I think Isa is better. What is, oh, there's a number of things that are wrong with this. Like I said, we don't have time for that. But one of the things which is wrong with this, which is fundamental to what we're saying here, is that what we are not allowed to do is to compare prophets and messengers with one another. It's not allowed. The Messenger of Allah was in a hadith agreed upon Bukhari and Muslim La tufaddiluni ala Musa Do not say that I am better than Musa Even though he actually is Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam But he's saying don't do that What's going to happen if you say Our Prophet is better than your Prophet? What's going to happen? Obviously if you go to a Yahudi now and say Muhammad is better than Musa What's going to happen? So he's saying here Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Don't do that In another hadith In another wording he said La تَخَيَّرُوا بَيْنَ anbiya. Do not choose one prophet over another prophet and say this prophet is better than that one, etc. And that's a very important thing for us to understand that we believe in all of them, we love all of them. Uh, every single one of them that has come with something is actually legislation for us and this is something that you might study in Usul al-Fiqh in this course, I'm not sure, but with the ulama of Usul, they have said the Sharia of those people that came before us is legislation for us also, as long as it doesn't contradict with Muhammad Sallallahu what he came with and what he abrogated. But the reason why Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala has told us about Adam, what He told us about Nuh, and what He told us about Hud and Saleh and Shu'ayb, and the list goes on. Alayhi Salam Jamian. What's the point then, if they are not prophets for us as well? What was the point? Was it just stories? No. So what we're saying here is that every single one of those Anbiya and those messengers that came for us, we believe in them, we love them, we don't try and differentiate between them, we follow their Sunnah. But our messenger ultimately is Muhammad Wasallam. And the haqq of the matter is, and the truth of the matter is, is that he is the best of them all. He was sent with haqq and huda. How do we recognize the messenger of Allah Wasallam? The author is saying here, we recognize him because he's been sent with the truth and he has been sent with guidance. The ulama have two ways of establishing Dila'il and Nubu'ah. Now this is basically going back to Dila'il and what we were talking about before. Dila'il and Nubu'ah, Dalil, Dila'il, plural, Nubu'ah. Evidence of prophethood. You've got this man here, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, a man who's come from the desert in the city of Mecca. He is claiming to be a prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We all believe in him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, categorically. How do we know that he is the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? The ulama have split it up into two. Number one, shari'i. And number two, sam'i. A shari'i are those legislative evidences that are found in the Qur'an and the Sunnah. So the Qur'an is Dalil. The Sunnah is Dalil. The fact that when he tells you to do something, you find goodness in it, is evidence. These are all Adilla al shariyah And then you have evidences which are sam'i. 
Now, sam'i are those things which you can observe and measure. So you can look at this person and say, you know what? If you want to call it scientific, you call it scientific up to you. But you can measure, you can see this person and say, you know what? I know he's speaking the truth because everything is adding up here. It's not just about faith anymore. It's not just about he's saying, well, this is what God told me and I'm telling you. It's not about that anymore. Even though that's an actual legitimate section, as we've just said. But there's another section as well. So included in the sam'iyat are those things which appeal to the fitrah, or those things which appeal to the intellect, and those things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him as miracles, that people witnessed and they said, we've seen this. So there are so many narrations that came to us, and this is in Sahih Muslim, where the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa had some stones in his hands, and the companions, they said, we had the stones making tasbih, and they were in his hands. Stones. Stones. And they were making tasbih. He said, we had this. Right. How do we hear it? We didn't hear it. But these are narrations that have been found in Sahih Muslim. And we know that this has tested and has been trialed and it's fulfilled all the criteria for us to now know that this is authentic. It's not made up. And we know that the ulama are impartial. Because if there has been a mistake here somewhere, they'll just reject it. They'll say, no, we can't attribute that to the Messenger of Allah. Even though it's nice to know that we've got something like this, but we're not going to accept it. It has to be authentic. Therefore, there are so many different miracles that come which feed into the sam'iyat, which are part of your aqal, part of your fitr, but also the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him miracles with the moon splitting, etc. And uh, the, as we said last week, Jabir radiallahu anhu, he said, we all had the tree crying until he put his, finger, his hands on it and he calmed it down. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So with this, the author is saying that the Messenger وسلم, was sent with the Haqq and Huda. What is the Haqq and Huda? The Haqq, as we said last week, is the true religion, the action. And the Huda is the ilm and the guidance. Now it's very important for us now here, and this is going to come at some point, I would imagine in about four or five sessions, where the author starts talking about Iman. And not to jump the gun too much, but the author is saying Iman is something that you believe inside, but it has to be in practice and in your actions and in your statements also. A person can't just say, well, I believe in Allah and I believe Muhammad is my messenger and I'm just going to carry on my lifestyle how I want to carry it out. And I'll believe in it, but I won't necessarily follow it. I'll carry on with the music and I'll carry on with the smoking and I'll carry on with all these different things which are haram. We will say, as the author will establish for us, inshallah, that this person is a Muslim. As long as he's got Iman, he's got Tawheed, he's a Muslim. He's a sinful Muslim, but he's a Muslim nonetheless. But the author is saying here, part of you following him, part of you believing in him, part of you supporting him, is for you to recognize that he came with the Haqq and the Huda. And it's not sufficient for a person to say, oh, I believe in the Messenger of Allah وسلم, and think himself to be guided and think himself to be safe. Hence, as the ulama have mentioned when they were talking this bit, they have said that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, came with a religion, bil wal huda, meaning that which has amr and nahi. Those things that he has told us to do and those things that he has told us to stay away from. And when you do that, you will have haq with you. And when you do that, you will have hidayah. And this is something we have to supplicate in every single one of our salawat. Ihdina sirat al mustaqim Oh Allah, guide us to the right path. What is the right path? Some of the ulama of tafsir have said, the sirat al mustaqim What's the sirat al mustaqim The straight path. That's the common translation of it. Some of the ulama of tafsir have said, no. The sirat al mustaqim is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, now let's read that again. إِهْدِنَا الصِّرَاطُ الْمُسْتَقِيمُ O oh Allah, guide us. Now this is something which is a pillar of your salah, which is a pillar of your iman. So you're saying, O oh Allah, guide us to the Sirat al-Mustaqim. Meaning, O oh Allah, give us knowledge and beneficial actions of what Muhammad wasallam came with. بِالْحَقِّ وَالْهُدَى Similar to what the author is saying here. What that basically means is that you follow him 
in that which he has told you to do and you stay away from what he has told you to stay away from this is because he is sent to all of us Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with the haqq al-huda or with nur wa diya and nur is differentiation between what is right and what is wrong so now he has explained to you the haqq al-huda But the nur and the diya is an illumination from that. Now you have a criterion and you are able to now differentiate between what is right and what is wrong. And this now completes what the author has to say. But there are two masail that I want to talk about before we finish. We've got 10 minutes left. Question number one, which is connected to our belief in prophethood. And this is something which is important when it comes to Ahl sunnah because the people of deviation have deviated in it is it wajib for Allah to send to us a prophet you might think this is a strange question you might not have had this question before but it is similar to what the author is saying here Allah has sent him to all of jinn all of man good we believe in that we have just talked about that I think we knew that before we even came to class right but connected to this bit here now was it wajib for Allah to send to us a prophet and, and, and a book? Did Allah have to do it? No? Huh? From his mercy. It's from his mercy. Excellent. This is the jawab and this is the belief of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. And this is exactly the wording Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً We've only sent you as a mercy. Meaning from Allah's mercy. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, some deviant sects have said it was wajib upon Allah to send us a prophet. And this is the belief of the Mu'tazila. And they basically say, listen, Allah created you, yeah? And now he's put you on earth. <coughs> he has decreed for you to live in Leicester. How do you know the right way from the wrong way? Except that Allah has to, has to send you a prophet and a messenger. That way, without us sending a prophet and a messenger, him putting you in Jannah will not be justified. And him putting you in the hellfire will not be justified. So they said it is wajib upon Allah to send us a prophet and a messenger. Na'udhu billah. Others, and this is well known from the Asha'ira, etc. They have said... Adding to this, not only is it wajib for Allah to send us a messenger, but it's also wajib for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send us a messenger with miracles. Why did they disagree? They said, listen, Mu'tazila, we don't agree with you on this. Because it's all well and good that Allah sends us to a messenger. But how do we know he's a messenger? There could be a person in your city in Mecca saying, I'm a messenger, I'm a messenger, I'm a messenger. But we don't recognize him as being a messenger. There's nothing there. So some of the Asha'ira have said, not, not only is it wajib for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send us a messenger, but it is wajib for Allah to send that messenger with miracles so that we can recognize him. Some of the people of Kalam, now this is a response now from the Mu'tazila towards the Asha'ira. I'm sorry if this is going in detail. They said we disagree with this. They said the Mu'tazila, it is wajib that Allah sends to us a messenger. But it is not wajib that Allah sends a messenger with miracles. Dalil, the Dajjal will come. And he will say, I am a messenger initially before he says he's a god. And he will come with miracles. He will say, Ahyu, and then the earth will come up. And he will say, Umtiri, and then the sky will rain, etc. So they will say, now here, look, this is proof according to you, that Dajjal is a prophet and a messenger. So the Mu'tazila rejected what the Asha'ira said. Now, can you see, the point I'm making here is that this is something which is semi-important to us right now. Not really that important. The main thing is that we understand what Ahlul Sunnah say. We need to know our Aqeedah. We don't need to know the Aqeedah of what's the rest of the world. You need to know what La ilaha illallah is and what Muhammad Rasulullah means so that you will be safe when you are living your life, when you are placed in your grave and when you are resurrected. 
But you need to know these things in some way because these kind of deviations come about. And the point that you get from all of this, if there is at least one point, which is the severity of not knowing aqeelah, which is the severity of falling into ilm al-kalam. Wallahi, my brothers, there's a lot of people in our community, I know you guys are still quite young, but there's a lot of people that go through tests in life, etc. And when they are tested, they don't look for answers from the kitab and the sunnah. They go onto YouTube and they start Googling and they start looking at what perhaps even kuffar philosophers have said and counsellors and all that kind of stuff. I'm not trying to say that these things are good and these things are bad. There could be some khairin, there could be some bad. But ultimately, the haq is with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent. And when people go into philosophy and theorizing, you can see how dangerous of a path it is. Ahl sunnah we say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent to us a prophet and a messenger out of his mercy. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent to us a prophet and a messenger with miracles out of his mercy and his favor over us. And this then feeds into what we were saying before, is that when you can recognize that, what does that do? That increases you in your iman, and that increases you in your humility and submission over him. The other view actually makes you arrogant with Allah. Because when they're saying no, it was wajib for Allah to send it in the first place. I'm not doing anything wrong. It's good that he did that. He needed to do that, a'udhu billah. You can see the arrogance in that. Right, last question before we finish today and we finish this topic. And the next topic, the author says, وَإِنَّ, وإن الْقُرْآنَ كَلَامُ اللَّهِ And surely the Qur'an is the speech of Allah. So next, se- next session, inshallah, we're going to be looking at the belief of Ahl sunnah when it comes to the Qur'an. Anyway, the last question here. Can prophets make mistakes? Is it possible for a prophet to make a mistake? Mistakes, sin, whatever you want to call it. It's possible for prophets to sin? They can make mistakes, but they can't sin. Uh, they can sin? Minor sin. Yeah. Oh, they are free from all forms of sin, minor and major. Uh, what do you think? They can sin. Okay, so now this sinning, does it happen before they are prophet or after they are prophet or anytime? Anytime. See, now this is another issue that the people of philosophy went into. Some of them said that no, they can't make mistakes at all. And the reason why is because once they make a mistake, they have negated their prophethood. How can a prophet come and say, don't do something, and he falls it to himself? Don't get angry, but then he falls it to himself. How can he say, be patient, he commands his ummah with something, but then he, didn't, he wasn't patient himself? So some of the people of Kalam have said, it's not possible for a prophet to make sins. Some of them have said, it is possible for him to do all forms of sins. And this is the worst thing that a person can say. And the reason why is because this actually affects the validity of him being able to convey the message. Ahl sunnah say that the prophets and the messengers, it is possible for them, some of them said, one last view before we get to Ahl sunnah, some of them said it is possible <coughs> excuse me, for them to make sins and errors before they were prophets, but after they were prophets, they don't make sins and errors. إِنَّا فَتَحْنَا لَكَ فَتْحَ مُبِينَ لِيَغْفِرُ لَكَ اللَّهِ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِنْ ذَنْبِكَ وَمَا تَأَخَّرَ Allah has given you a fat which is the opening of Hudaybiyah, which is a clear victory over the Quraysh, so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive you of your previous sins and your forthcoming sins. Ahl sunnah of the view that it is possible for prophets and messengers to make errors and mistakes. But those errors and mistakes, two things are connected to that. Number one, there are no errors and mistakes when it comes to them being able to convey the message. And number two, those errors and mistakes are not major. So it's not possible for a prophet or a messenger to commit shirk or to commit a major sin. But it is possible for them to make a mistake or a minor error. And this is the belief of Ahl sunnah 
wal jama'a. So when the author is saying here that he's the Imam al atqiya he's a person that is followed in all aspects and he is a person who's completed taqwa, this is correct. This is because perfection is only for Allah. Complete perfection <coughs> is only for Allah. It is possible for even the Messenger of Allah وسلم, to make an error or make a mistake. But we don't, obviously, in our aqidah, is not to talk about them. As the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said, don't differentiate between them. That would then also mean, don't talk about their, have love for them, you have respect for them, etc. So we don't talk about, is it possible? This is an issue, like we have said, that the people of Kalam, etc. brought up, and this is then now the response of the people of Sunnah. That it is possible for them to make mistakes. However, it is not connected to anything which is major. Allah protected and preserved them from kufr and shirk and nifaq. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected them from major sins. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected them from any mistake which would occur in them being able to convey the message. This now, alhamdulillah, concludes what the author had to say when it comes to belief in the Messenger of Allah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he makes us the best of followers to the best of the anbiya. And that he makes us the leaders of those who have been sent from the best of the ummah. And likewise, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he illuminates for us our path to him in the dunya and that he takes us in the best of taking and that he makes our best day the best day that we stand in front of him, the last day. And then we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he makes our statement the last of statements. Hada, wallahu alam, sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi sahbihi ajma'in.